Howdy folks, it's Travis from Doing Stuff with TNA. Today I'm working on TTR-125. This is one that I picked up. I picked this thing up for a hundred and I think a hundred dollars flat, maybe a hundred and fifty. Anyway, the engine was locked up. So this was the first engine rebuild I ever did. And she runs well now. So last season got a little bit of runtime on it. This season I've had to clean the carburetor out. The needle valve, one of them was clogged. And so once I cleaned the carburetor out, I uh, just suggested a little, getting it ready to run. I'm gonna change the oil now because that was the first break-in oil. And so you don't wanna run more than about a few hours on that and then get it changed. It'll have a little more metal than normal. And these engines, they do not have oil filters on them. So you really need to go ahead and just change on that oil after the first ride. So that's what we're gonna do. This should be quick and easy. You have done oil before. Seriously? I put that on pretty tight, I guess. I don't feel like playing around this morning. Let's get this done, please. Let's take a look at that oil. Oh, it's still pretty clean, actually. Not too bad. These things really take very little oil, though. And you can see, you see in that oil, there is some something other than just oil in it. It's pretty light though. Enough, I'm glad I'm changing it. We'll let that drain and close it up and add fresh oil. What I use for oil is Rotella T6 5W40. It is JASO MA and MA2. See right there? That means it's safe for wet clutches. So this is 100% safe for a wet clutch. And this is a good temperature range for almost all of your small engines. Why spend more? This stuff is great. So while I'm doing this, I thought maybe I would discuss some of the most common problems you're gonna have with a motorcycle. You only really need to check. Most times, your bike, if it's set for the season, the problems, if it's got a carburetor, the problem is just gonna be a clogged up carburetor. One of your jets is gonna be clogged, there's gonna be trash in the bowl, and that's just life of gas. Even if you get ethanol free, that can happen. It's super easy. Jets are simply little brass tubes that have tiny holes in them. All you do is unscrew those two, and they have two. They have one for idle and one for main. And I'll tell you what those are for a minute, but you unscrew both of them, you clean them out, they'll have holes that go through the center, and then they'll have holes on the sides. Clean out all the holes. Once that's done, thing will run, almost every time. The only other possible problem you could have is that carburetors have little holes that feed around through it and sometimes those will get clogged so just make sure you any little hole you can find that you're able to spray carb cleaner through it or even brake cleaner just be careful of your rubber parts if you're using brake cleaner that is the most common problem with bikes uh, your next most common problem is going to be if your battery's dead that's simple people uh, I, I don't understand why there needs to be so much conversation about my bike won't start well the battery dead that should be a no-brainer so you've got a couple of things you need for an engine to run you have to have fuel air spark compression and timing that's all if you've got all of those things it's gonna work on an older engine on a newer engine you're gonna have a little bit of other stuff to deal with because of the fuel injection like your injectors but it's still those same five things just a little bit different because with your fuel and air you're dealing with a carburetor right or you're dealing with injectors and the intake so it's very much the same just a little bit different in the execution fuel what to check with your fuel make sure uh, tanks have a filter on them usually a little screen on the inside make sure that's not clogged make sure you if it's got a filter on it that's not clogged make sure it flows I like using uh, see-through tubing so that you can see that the gas is actually flowing if not the tubing then the filter see-through so you can see that the filter is getting gas in it air well there's a such thing as too much and too little air and this is particularly true with carburetors so a carburetor works by the Venturi effect if I said that right I think I did basically that creates a suction that pulls the gas through that suction cannot happen if you don't have a good seal on the carburetor to the engine. That boot between the engine and the carb must be good. If it's cracked, you're screwed. Not screwed, but it's not gonna run. Even if it runs, it won't run well. You'll have trouble, especially with idling. Air leaks are one of your biggest issues aside from getting fuel. 
most of the time those are the problems a bike's gonna have if it's set. Uh, I have seen where rodents get into the air boxes and then clog up the intake so that's a possibility but again that's air air and fuel the others only come into play if it was running fine and suddenly stopped nine times out of ten or if you did some work and now it doesn't run uh, usually that sort of thing but those aren't usually hard to figure out either unless you have something tricky like a my i, I bought a yzf 426 that was non-running it's an 01 so it doesn't have auto decompression on the exhaust valve and they were known to be hard to start well all i did was replace the exhaust cam no problem starting it now it is so easy if i forget to use the choke i can even get it started which why would i forget but i do sometimes there can be some tricky things fixing bikes for sure fixing engines for sure uh, you can have valve issues and that sort of stuff but that's compression they're common problems but they're not common common problems they're not the normal problem compression you can usually tell if you're getting compression pull the spark plug out put your finger on it crank it over it should be able to blow your finger off of it so if it's not that then there's definitely a compression issue even if there is that there could be a compression issue but you can still get it to run it may not run well and that that's where you might need a compression tester but generally you're not gonna you're gonna see it smoking and such with it not running well and you'll know uh, that's what actually happened on this TTR originally when I rebuilt it I used reused the piston well that was a bad idea I ended up having to pull the head back off and put a new piston in it but I knew it was a problem because it was smoking. It still ran. It was still getting compression. It just wasn't great compression. So it was letting oil pass. It wasn't, uh, it was burning oil. It didn't need a compression tester to find that out. Actually, bigger engines are easier. They're more, they're less sensitive usually to, to small leaks. It's called a petcock in case you've never done these things before. Where the fuel goes into the carburetor there's a need i'm sure you can find a video on it but it basically just lets gas into the bowl of the carburetor and then shuts it off why do they do that well they need a bit of gas there for it to be able to have that venturi effect of flow up into the engine so it has to have a bowl of gas down there but you can't be overfilling that bowl or it'll just leak out everywhere or it'll clog things up it, it, it'll get where it shouldn't be so so they have that valve basically that shuts off once there's enough gas in the bowl and it once the gas gets low in the bowl then then it automatically turns on and that's what the floats do they just judge the level of the fluid in the bowl timing what is timing well there's two types of motorcycles or engines really two stroke four stroke two stroke literally means every time the piston goes up there's a spark and it will ignite and push the piston back down then the piston comes back up and it happens again a four stroke goes up down up explosion down up why because it has a a cycle where it has to exhaust the gases so when it goes down it get, and it's starting to come back up it gets its fuel and air and then it compresses it and fires then it goes down and comes back up and exhausts all that air when it comes back up that's a four stroke most of your vehicles are four stroke your small engines like lawnmowers they're four stroke your weed eaters and such tend to be two stroke difference is revving speed and complexity of the engine so okay what timing is timing just tells the spark when to spark is the piston all the way up to the top if so that's when the well actually not quite then right before it gets to the top is where it will spark to start igniting the gas the reason it get, does it right before it gets to the top is that gas takes time to explode and expand it takes a split second but it's enough difference between when it's going up to when it starts going back down so that's that's called timing advance usually your timing is set just by the cam chain the position of the cams and basically a cam is simply a shaped lobe that rotates around in order to press the valves open and close what are valves well we're getting too deep forget about that but timing basically it has to do with those valves and that spark so you got to have the spark at the right time if you don't have the spark at the right time the engine won't run so that's timing that's what most people refer to when they're talking about timing spark well that's pretty simple you've got the ignition system you've got the coil you've got batter coil which generates the electricity typically things that'll go bad are the stator will go bad which is just a bunch of coils on a thing where a magnet rotates around it so it generates electricity then you have your coil 
those can go bad they don't tend to and you have your spark plug wires and spark plug so yeah what is spark that should be pretty simple is the spark plug sparking take it out and clamp it somehow so it's ground so the body of it's grounded and see does the spark plug spark if it does you've got spark it may not be timed right but you have spark so fuel air compression spark timing we've talked about them all and that's what it takes to make an engine run the concept isn't that hard you have those five things you have some things that go along with those things how to diagnose them but if you just think logically about troubleshooting something it's not that hard now you can get more in depth like for a carburetor let's say your bike will only run if the choke is on well that almost always means the idle jet is clogged the idle jet is the two smaller of the two jets in a carburetor and it's the most common one to clog because it's got the smaller holes so yeah you, if you can't get the bike to idle unless the choke's on there's your problem your other option is you can't get it to run at all well if you spray fuel straight down the pipe not, not pipe not to, straight past the carb will it fire off a few times or, or even run for a little bit if it will well you're not getting fuel so either the bowl doesn't have fuel which is easy enough to check you take the bowl off is it fuel ball drain out of it or both your jets are clogged or one of the passageways in the carburetor is clogged so let's say you rev the bike up and at first you pull the throttle back and at first it revs up and then it dies down and starts cutting out and and dies on you until you let off the throttle and then it idles again what that's weird well if it idles but it won't rev probably got a clogged main jet which is the bigger of the two which is how the majority of the fuel gets into there so what happens is when you're cranking back on that throttle at first it's got the fuel from the idle jet and that's enough for a little bit but as you sustain it it ain't and so now it's got too much air because you opened up when you pull back on the throttle it also opens up the the airflow for the carb and not enough fuel so it starts cutting out because it can't run on too little fuel and lots of air that's a few things as for oh there was one other thing i wanted to talk about not related to running related to your chain i didn't i didn't understand for a while i, I had never looked up uh, people always said change your chain why okay it stretches big deal just i can take a link out right if i really need to well i found out why when your chain starts stretching it actually starts wearing out the sprocket and so your sprocket should have tight little u-shapes in it when the chain is wearing out it will actually grind on the sides of those u-shapes and and braid it out and it'll make it where it's more likely to slip so yeah that that's why you replace your chain you also will need to replace the sprocket eventually too because that's going to happen regardless and so if your sprocket gets worn then it'll start destroying the new chains so yeah but i found that interesting i didn't know they wore like that i mean i knew the chain stretch but i didn't know the sprocket wore I think that's all I've got for you. This bike is getting a new chain and a battery. I've just been running it with no battery because it doesn't require one to run. It makes it easier to start because it is an electric start. Uh, this thing was torn up. Key switch was destroyed. The wiring was destroyed. The engine was locked up. Tons of parts were missing. So after getting it for 100 bucks, I then ended up spending $900 on parts. And that wasn't buying the expensive crank. That was buying a cheap $100 Chinese crank. All the other bearings in the case that I had to replace, they're expensive. The gaskets, the new piston and rings, the a whole bunch of various parts, a new carburetor, because the old carburetor wasn't the right one. Some new lines, new uh, grips, new controls, um, because both the clutch and the brake side were broken i did have to do something the the push rod something with the clutch was broken i also had to get a new clutch cable just so much stuff was just missing or broken the brakes didn't work at all oh the rear tire was shot not i mean not the tire the the uh the metal tube that goes inside the tire that the bearings press against was gone and so the bearings were destroyed and the rim was in pretty bad shape but i managed to reuse it it'll get light riding with the wipes it'll be fine uh the spacers were missing the chain guards were missing this was a fun thing to do if you want to get into 
repairing engines, something small like this is perfect to start with. You can even find a complete teardown of this engine online. It's a video in another language, so you can't really hear anything, but you can see everything, which is pretty cool. Um, and of course you can find all the breakdowns of these things, the parts website, I can't think of the name but they, they show the diagram so that you can order the right part. Found lots of stuff on e or bought lots of stuff from eBay. Anyway, I'm quite happy with how the bike turned out overall. Being my first full engine rebuild, I have a couple more going on. But I thought I'd take some time and talk about this bike since I'm working on it. Uh, oh, I replaced the tires. I cleaned up the rims and painted, well, the rear one. I cleaned it up because it was really badly rusty and painted it silver. I uh, painted the frame where it was rusty, cleaned up the tank. As bad as the tank looked, it was way worse. Uh, put the seat cover on it. Anywho, I think I'm done talking about this. I'm going to finish doing the oil. I do not remember how much oil this thing's supposed to get. But we have a handy dipstick, so what you do, your filler decks are always dirty. Try to keep them closed off. Hard to tell though with these things. It looks full. I put just a little more in there. Definitely good now. Aside from the chain and the battery, she's ready to go. Battery goes right here. Uh, there's the new carburetor. There's an adjustment screw right up under here. Well, hope you learned something. Thanks for watching. All right, guys. So we're back to the TTR 125. I've got the new chain in, and I'm hoping it's right. But we'll see here shortly. I've got the master link right here on this chain. So I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna get this off. I'm not gonna bother trying to take the tire off. Just gonna pull the master link. So I'll show you how to do that real quick. There. Now I'm gonna have to loosen this rear tire up to slide it forward, because this was definitely stretched. It should be the same length aside from the stretch. So we'll check that real quick. See if I can find the master link in this one real quick. That looks pretty close to the same length. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop the master link off of this one and put it on. Of course, sitting it down, I lost where it was. Problem is when it's not on your chain, it's pretty hard to push on it. There we go. I don't think you saw that. That was a little difficult. And there went a piece I need. Pull across the floor. I'm gonna try and get this chain on first though before I go chasing that. Alright, so what I've done is I've got the uh, chain on the front gear. I'm just using my finger to rotate it. I think you can see it right through there. I should be getting the chain down here where it should start being able to be routed. That's right there. Uh, my finger's on the very end of it now. So I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing, which is speeding this chain. Holding both ends to keep it out of the dirt. Alright, so I've got the chain down here now. Trying to feed it through where it goes. There we are. The sprocket's right there. And so I was just had my finger here on the bottom of the sprocket, feeding it around. And now I've fed the chain through under here. Fetch that piece that went flying. There it is. That's my hands off. Chain around. And yeah, as I suspected. I am going to have to loosen up the uh, tire. I'm just going to wrap this chain up around this top area and get my tools to loosen this up. Alright, so that's set on pretty much the minimum setting there. Let's rotate the chain around. Oh yeah, now that's plenty of length. Which way should this go? Does it go this way so that it faces that way or does it go this way so it faces that way? Well. If it's facing this way, then if it hits something down here, since the chain's gonna go that way, it won't cause it to come off. However, if it hits something up here, it still can cause it to come off. But I figure this is the safer way, so that's what I'm gonna do. Yep, it's on all the way. Now we just gotta tighten up the chain a little by rotating these guys. So you bring it all the way down. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Getting these matched up on both sides is how you keep everything 
straight and the rear tire aligned. You can see, you see the tire moving back and forth as I'm doing this. So you see that chain still a little loose. As you watch the back of the tire as I move this next one. See? Shift it to the side. That chain's pretty good now. A little bit of slack, but not too much. I'm going to tighten this bolt up. All done. The battery's in it already. I, I don't think I recorded that, but it is in there, and I've got it on charge. But see how easy it starts. A little bit of choke might help, but still. Uh, the choke won't stay on. I've got to hold it. I can't hold you in it. Anyway, she runs great. So she's ready for the wife to ride. I don't think I have any video of rebuilding it, but I do have some pictures. I'll throw them up. So you can see some of that process. That, that's another project done.